Good morning. All right, so let's get uh, this panel going. Um, so thank you all for coming. I guess we're running a little late. We have around 40 minutes, so try and make the most of our time. Uh, my name is Ashish Nadkarni. I'm part of IDC's research uh, team. I'm based in Boston, and it's my honor and privilege to be uh, moderating this panel. We have an exciting uh, bunch of folks here, and hopefully some questions to get the uh, conversation going. Um, I want to make this interactive. We, it's still the morning. Some of, the, some of you have probably not caffeinated yourselves enough. But I want to keep this interactive. I have a bunch of questions. Um, but really, you know, I want you guys to ask. This is your time to ask questions as well. So let's see how it goes. I'll walk around and hand the mic. So if you have a question you need to ask, just raise your hand, and uh, I'll walk over to you. Um, all right, so with that said, a um, couple of housekeeping items. I am told that there are t-shirts to be given off after, after this panel, so feel free to grab a t-shirt on your way out. Another thing to note is Scality is going to have a demo, um, not the session afterwards, but the one after that. So feel free to come back and um, see um, how Scality is uh, doing their demo. So. All right, so with that, I'm going to hand it uh, to the panelists to introduce themselves, and let's get it going. Thanks. So, um, Steve, you want to go first? Thank you, Ashish. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm losing my voice. I apologize. Uh, my name is Steve Muir. Uh, I'm the executive director of the uh, Elastic Cloud Infrastructure at Comcast. Uh, we run OpenStack uh, in production at scale. Um, I'm very happy to be here to talk about the uh, past and future OpenStack. Thank you. Uh, Mark Shuttleworth from Ubuntu and Canonical. Hi, I'm uh, Jerome Lecat, the CEO of Skelety. Hey, I'm Matt Curley. I'm from HPE, and uh, I work with uh, big scale-out specific servers for things like object storage, uh, HPC, and uh, big data. Awesome. So the theme for today's conversation is about OpenStack at six years and what has worked, what has not worked. So it's a conversation around what you guys are seeing what we are seeing, what the panelists are seeing on um, the six-year anniversary. Um, you know, we got news from the user survey that 65% of uh, OpenStack deployments are in production now. So clearly, something is really working. Um, and so the question I think I'm going to start with Steve, being you know a user of OpenStack, what would you say has worked and what has not? So maybe you can sort of give a user perspective, and then we can go to uh, the supply, get the supplier perspective. Thank you. Um, as I said, we run uh, OpenStack in production at Comcast. Uh, we've been running since Essex, so uh, four years or so. Um, we have a very widely uh, diverse multi-tenant set of customers, so uh, that works very well. Mm -hmm. The core of OpenStack uh, is extremely robust. Uh, it works. Uh, we've been very happy with that. I think the challenges we've seen, what doesn't work so well is uh, scalability. We're really kind of pushing the limits there. And, and the limits are not that high. You know, certainly hundreds of physical servers, uh, everyone we talk to, all the involvement in the large deployment community, everyone is hitting the same pain points around scalability. Um, and I think just general maturity of the, the OpenStack development process. Uh, before I, I took on uh, this team, I was a customer of our OpenStack deployment. And just silly little API compatibility or tool compatibility things that just create additional work unnecessarily. So I think attention to detail in terms of um, backwards compatibility, upgradability, um, those kinds of things uh, really maybe haven't been a focus of the community. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something where potentially vendors can help drive that by making the emphasis on this is how we become a, an enterprise grade, uh, truly usable platform. We've invested a lot to get to where we are. We've been very happy with the core of OpenStack, but I think there's a lot of work to do going forward to build it out into sort of the, the tool that it could be. Awesome. So, yeah. so yeah. I'll take the next part of this. Um, so my perspective is a little different from, you know, you've seen some of the sponsor sessions, et cetera, from HP around here. And they're certainly working to sort of bring some of those robust vendor pieces into it. The conversations that I have, um, you certainly have in the kind of scale-out issues that you're talking about, 
And really it's been kind of like two classes of customer that are ready for it. And what we work with on the solution side with things like Scality is there are people that are absolutely ready for it and they're willing to put the engineering in and build that expertise. But there's been a real chasm with our conversations with people that say, hey, I just can't figure out what's out there. I can't sort of filter uh, the noise from what's really gonna work for me. And some of that product stuff is just not ready for that class of enterprise customer. And they want something that's very customizable, but they're a little bit lost still as to what's out there. Good, so Jerome uh, or Mark? Yeah, uh, maybe uh, to offer another vendor perspective, um, and actually we're both a vendor and a user because we have a fairly large uh, test and uh, continuous delivery process that's actually running on OpenStack. Um, two, um, two, two thoughts. First of all, as a vendor, it's actually not easy to understand where to put our efforts to complement what you described. So we realized that uh, OpenStack has uh, a lot to be done, a lot will be done by the open source community, and that's great, and a lot can be done by the commercial vendors. Um, but we're, we're struggling finding where does the community want us to work for, and, and we would focus on that if we knew. Mark? Um, so uh, I think I can support the view that the core of OpenStack has worked well. Uh, I think, it, it, you know, you ask someone out there in our industry on the street, what's OpenStack? They say it's an infrastructure as a service, and in that spirit, it's, it's cracking on really well. Um, I think what has failed is the broader big tent. Uh, and I think there's a reason, and, and to be clear, you know, one can love a project and still offer critique. I think it's important. Um, and I think the reason it, it, it's failing us is twofold. First, um, uh, much of what is being put into the big tent has nothing to do with the mission of infrastructure as service, right? And so that makes for a confusing message to, to users. It's branded OpenStack, and they think OpenStack's an infrastructure as a service, and this stuff is branded OpenStack, so how, how does that work? And I think that speaks to the, the, your point about where do we participate, where do we contribute? I think that's the first issue. In Linux, we have a very clean line. You know, there's the kernel, and Linus is really good at saying that doesn't belong in the kernel, go somewhere else. And I don't care where you go, but go somewhere else, right? We don't have that crisp view here. I think that's a failure, and, and we should address it. Um, the second reason I think the big tent is failing us is because the reality is the motivations for many of those projects are vendor motivations and not user motivations. And uh, we should be honest about that. Right? Uh, my view is that the vast majority of those things will fail, call it the collapsing of the big tent, uh, and the headlines then will be confusing. The headlines will be that this is all about the failure of OpenStack because we've called those things OpenStack. Right? But the reality is OpenStack is gonna power on, right? in the same way that the internet didn't stop in 2000. Right? Dot com nonsense stopped, but the internet kept powering on. And I think that moment, the sooner it comes, the better because you know, um, that is essentially going to be, make things much clearer for users as to what is OpenStack, what is important about OpenStack, and that that is successful, uh, faces challenges around scaling and so on, but we can deal with those challenges, right? What we can't deal with is the endless addition of complexity for no real reason that essentially tarnishes the image of the core. So, so Mark, what is OpenStack? Okay. Or what, what should OpenStack be in your mind? Yeah, that's a great question. So, great. <laughs> right, to me it's super straightforward, and I, c I couldn't believe that it took us two years to sort of even talk about the topic, right? But uh, OpenStack is um, virtual networks, disks, and compute, right? With the critical supporting infrastructure, and that I would say is, is um, uh, identity, security, and, um, and I, I would put things like Barbican and Desi Designate into that because they're part of that critical infrastructure. Outside of that, you're in user space. Right? And you really should be somewhere else. The acid test would be to say, can you run your stuff, this other stuff, database as a service, messaging as a service, blah, 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 bullshit as a service, can you run that on AWS? <laughs> right? Because the only things that are gonna matter to a CIO, right, in that foobar as a service category, are things that they can consume on, in a hybrid way, right? On AWS, on Azure, on Google, and on OpenStack. And I think we're missing the, the, the DNA to draw that line really clearly and firmly. So that's a good question. So I just uh, wanted, before we jump back into the questions, how many people here have OpenStack, OpenStack deployed? Wow, oh, it's a good chunk. So do you guys agree with what, uh, what is being said about the challenges with OpenStack? 
Yeah, awesome. Thank you. So, so then I guess I want to throw it back to you and say, you see that uh, there's a one of the complaints that um, we hear often is the quality and consistency of projects is um, not the same across the board. And I'm sort of wondering, you know, so if you take the storage projects, you take some of the other, you know, networking projects, they are at different levels of maturity, different levels of consistency, quality, and that kind of, you know, impacts the users from a deploying from deploying the whole thing, you know. So um, how do we, why is that, and how do we take care of it? So who wants to go? I mean, Matt, do you want to? I'll start a little bit on that. So yeah, I mean, I, I think when we talk about things like uh, guidance, there's too much vendor BS coming into it. It just collapses under like, you know, some sort of cash priority. If there's no real sort of guidance, um, then you end up with a bunch of people saying, okay, I want to throw everything with the kitchen sink into it. So I think we've seen a lot of this sort of stuff where we say, yeah, I mean, bullshit is a service or people putting things together and we don't have this sort of come back and say, okay, what do we want to do with this? What's the overall vision? I mean, I actually have an overall question. I mean, from the community standpoint, I mean, you talk about things like that in the kind of the core, which is very much what I see and what my customers want say, how can I get that stable picture? But for some of these things, I mean, there's a bunch of people out there that believe that it's an overall integration engine, which I think is a very different sort of view. And I'm not sure how we get those people together and aligned. I think that's part of it. Also, with all these different projects, it's kind of hard. I mean, you need real leaders kind of driving this stuff. So, so I think a good way to look at this, and I think Mark really, you hit it a, a good point, which is the whole kernel user space. And I think a good analogy, sort of take that one step further is, the kernel versus the Linux distro, right? To, some, to most consumers, Linux is a distribution and Ubuntu is very successful and so on. Uh, OpenStack is, in some sense, the core of OpenStack is the kernel, but what users want to consume does not have to be defined as OpenStack. I think getting to your point. Yeah. Um, and so I'll just talk about how we do this in Comcast. Before I came onto this team, I worked on a product building database as a service. But we understood that that was a customer of OpenStack, and there was no desire or intention to move that into the infrastructure team, right? We provide it as a multi-tenant service to our customers. And so our customers see an environment, this is kind of like AWS, where there's the value add of all the stuff, DynamoDB and Route 53 and so on, above the infrastructure. But you don't have to brand that as OpenStack. And I think it's a temptation to say, let's, and I don't, I'm going to, you know, it's not about Sahara or Trove or whatever specifically, but I do think it's very tempting to just add stuff in because of various reasons mm -hmm. that don't serve the goal of focusing that core. Yeah. Our OpenStack deployment is as core as you can get. It is literally just the core stuff. We don't deploy any of that extra thing. We're looking at some of the Barbican, the designate and so on, but it's literally just the core and it works great and that has made our life so much simpler than getting into it. People come and ask us, they say, how about this shared file system stuff? And I'm kind of like, no, you don't, you know, we're not going to make that part of our core infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. We provide key primitives and we will have a higher level environment, but that is not OpenStack. So and a couple of years ago, there was this whole <laughs> DEF core initiative and I don't think they talk about DEF core much here. Um, from your perspective, you know, the, the, I, so I agree with you, Steve, at the core and, and what Mark, you mentioned. How do you, how do you implement it from a vendor's perspective? What, what do you see as the way to go about um, taking care of the core versus sort of looking at it in sort of layers of an onion or concentric circles, however you want to call it? I mean, do you? If, it, if it's for me as a vendor, I'm very confused. Uh, I, I said it earlier. I, I, I wonder where, where the community wants us to be and where, you know, where they want us to develop. Um, Swift is a great example. Is, is Swift an API, which I, I think that totally belongs to OpenStack, or is Swift an implementation? Uh, so we've, defi we've basically plugged our own storage implementation behind the open source API, sure. which we think is the right model, uh, but I know that not everyone thinks so. Um, and uh, you know, along these lines, um, I, I fully agree with Mark said earlier. I think that what uh, users want, and this is especially true for a large enterprise, is the freedom to be able to deploy their application on any cloud. 
uh, whether it's an OpenStack cloud, an AWS cloud, an Azure cloud, or whatever, because some other flavors are going to come out. Yeah. And, um, and I think that OpenStack has been uh, running at, as its own island. And in some ways, it was the first one. It, it, it's the first one that put an intention mm -hmm. out. Uh, but now it's not the only one anymore on the planet. And, and there's a real question of, okay, what, what are the interoperability? Um, you know, and, and just to keep in uh, storage, because this is the field that I know the best, um, we, we think that the uh, Amazon S3 API has become the de facto standard. That, that's what most people want. And yes, there are people who started deploying OpenStack, so they want Swift just because they're used to it. Mm -hmm. But if you look at enterprise who are starting from scratch today, and that's the vast majority, um, their natural tendency is to go to the S3 API. Sorry. So I think this question is only confusing if um, if you're talking to people who have a vendor perspective, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, look at the Linux kernel. We have a VFS layer, and it's an API. And if you you can plug in lots of file systems because they fit into the VFS VFS layer. Mm -hmm. And as a file system vendor, you know you're not going to get into the kernel if you don't fit in with the VFS layer, right? And as a user, you know you can add all these file systems because it'll fit into the kernel. This is only confusing because of vendor politics and dynamics, and that's only a problem because leadership in OpenStack is a political exercise. Now, if you just want to think for a while, you know, this is a choice we all made, but it's a choice we can change, right? People love comparing Linux and OpenStack. And I'd like to ask how many people have participated in the election process for a, for a Linux kernel subsystem maintainer? <laughs> None, right? So this is a choice that we've made. Uh, we, have a, we have an excellent foundation. It seems like, seems like they could employ subsystem maintainers who could be vendor neutral. And at that point, you'd have no problem getting an answer to your question, right? Yeah. I welcome that day. Yeah. So I want to kind of yeah, do a quick poll. Oh, there's a question. Okay, one second. Uh, I would like to ask the panel: uh, Is OpenStack a system, ad a system administration toy or something? If you think that nothing from uh, application or any community is going to impact OpenStack, so I think uh, the statement that Big Ten is a disaster is. I would argue that no, like we have open uh, OPNFE, open platform for NFE. We need something from Neutron for the SDN controllers to be able to operate, interoperate with uh, OpenStack. So how can you say that Big Tent is a disaster? So, uh, I, I and not only that, the additional thing is product working group is definitely working towards different verticals to be operated on top of IaaS whatever you call it. But that means there is a requirement from the industry f to OpenStack to grow beyond the six years what it has done. So I would not agree with you on that, that we need to have testing, critical testing of OpenStack through verticals. So I, thank I, you. I think you may ask some good questions. Uh, I think OPNFE is a good example of something that we absolutely do not want to bring into OpenStack. Uh, and so, yes, Neutron has to provide APIs, but Neutron has APIs. And if the APIs are missing something, then we'll add, that should be added to the core of OpenStack. But going back to your initial point, uh, I don't think there's a, any problem here. You know, as Mark said, OpenStack is a core set of systems, components that work together to manage your infrastructure. That's all it is. That's exactly how we position it at Comcast, it's the infrastructure orchestration for all physical compute storage and networking. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that we don't care about our application developers, our middleware, I know it's not a trendy term, but you, everyone knows what I mean, mm -hmm. colloquially, uh, developers. Of course we do, but that's not the concern of the OpenStack community or the OpenStack developers. Their job, just like Linus doesn't care about people building JVMs or people building <coughs> Apache or Firefox or whatever, nor should he. Mm -hmm. The OpenStack community needs to be able to focus on building that core infrastructure orchestration service or environment and 
yes, there are working groups and so on that can focus on verticals and testing absolutely critical and oper interoperability with open daylight or other controllers, absolutely important too. But that doesn't mean that that needs to be part of OpenStack per se. OpenStack needs to have that same level of focus as Linus has. That isn't to say that the way he does it should be replicated. I think nobody would argue that. Mm -hmm. But that model has worked incredibly well. Maybe Mark is you know, the benevolent dictator. Maybe the benevolent dictator for life thing is, I don't know, maybe it's Mark. Um, uh, I'd be okay with that. You sound a reasonable guy. Um, but I, I think the, the core works well. We should focus on that and not get distracted by political or whatever objectives to expand and in mm -hmm. increase scope. And that's exactly why we have APIs boundaries for interconnection to other things, and they can stay in their own domains. So let's bring me to the next sec set of questions on influence and meritocracy. Um, so we have a bunch of uh, OpenStack users here. So I have like a quick show of hands on, you're here, you're at the summit. Do you believe you have an adequate level of influence over what's happening at OpenStack? So who, who believes that there is influence on your deployment? I mean, you have. So, wow, so, so you do believe that there is more you could do. Do you believe that you can do more um, on um, um, sort of influencing OpenStack in a direction that's you know, taking into account your, you know, your feedback? Anyone? Ashish, can I ask a quick sort of yeah. follow-up question? Yeah. Just because of the show of hands was so small, how many people contribute code to OpenStack? Right, so that to me, that is influence. And I, I think that's real. if you want to influence, contribute code. I mean, it's open source, it's open. And so, I mean, do you, do you feel yet that you have a way to contribute code if you would like to contribute code? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. The thing is, I think there's a difference. I mean, I, sure. I, don't, I don't spend 100% of my time trying to contribute code to OpenStack. So, uh, so as a technical guy, I could have more influence by spending closer to 100% of my time doing that, but I don't think that's the kind of influence that you guys are talking about. <laughs> because you're talking about a kind of influence which would be more than 100% of your own personal time. How many folks would like to have an OpenStack where without hiring anybody who knows anything about OpenStack, you can just say, there's a bunch of racks, please make me a cloud, <coughs> right? So that my developers can be productive. Well, hallelujah, let's work towards that. And in that process, wouldn't you like to be able to choose, oh, I just want to, to, to use Scality's backend storage for object storage, or I want to use um, Swift Stacks, or I want to use another vendor's EMC, Oracle, doesn't matter, right? Make, make, make technical choices. Don't have to get into the weeds about how all of those things fit together and get your developers focused, I think, on what really matters, which is the apps that are critical for a particular operation, right, a particular mission. Who would go with that as a, as a mission? Yes. OK. Yeah, good. So um, talking about meritocracy, and I think the foundation likes to talk about meritocracy in OpenStack and you know, the ability to kind of you know, what gets elected you know, in sort of the self-election process. So what uh, you know, would you say is how is that process working or not working from a um, code contribution perspective? You know, I, I believe all three of you in some way, shape, or form um, or you, your teams contribute code to OpenStack. Do you believe that that process is working, not working? I mean, I, I'm certainly less experienced than some of these guys, but I, I, it's available there. I think one of the hard things when you talk about it, there are very few people who are actually available to say, I can spend 100% of my time there. I think there is, however, some community contribution you see in other areas that also has been feeding in. I mean, people are giving real feedback about their deployments. I mean, a lot of sessions like that are very popular here, and that is a real contribution to the community. Um, there's documentation stuff. Honestly, a lot of the API stuff, the code may even be good, but without some sort of clear information on how you can extend this stuff, mm -hmm. that's confusing a lot of stuff in vendors. So I, I think there are certainly big missing pieces, but from my perspective as a vendor who can hire people there, it's not bad to contribute in. Now, some of the projects, it's a little bit harder to actually say, hey, can we really treat this in a meritocratic way and get features in? Mm -hmm. So um, we, we've been contributing code around uh, the storage projects. And um, I mean, the, the feedback from my team is that that process is working very well. I, I don't think we have a problem there. Mm -hmm. I think we have more of a problem in, and this, this has been the theme over the past 20 minutes, um, 
what project should be in and what are the projects, but better defining. So it's really a leadership in, in terms of direction rather than accepting and discussing code contribution. To my knowledge, this is working very well. We should think a little bit about leadership and what leadership is about and tough decisions. So I have a view, which is that nothing important can get done without taking tough decisions. What makes a decision tough? It's not that it's technically difficult. It's that different people want different things, right? So if you believe that, and I think this is the core truth about leadership and decisioning, right? Then you have to ask, how can we have a process whereby to stay a leader, you must be elected, right? What are we doing? We're saying that the best way to stay a leader is not to make decisions, which are tough ones, right? This is what we've built ourselves, right? The truth is, people are afraid of leadership because they, they realize that every now and then a decision will be taken that they don't like or don't agree. The flip side to that, though, is that decisions do get taken. It's just that it's unclear who took them or why. You know, you get that old, well, we took that decision as a community. Well, I know how that ends, which is badly, right? Again, look at, look at the Linux project. Linus is able to take decisions. Sometimes he gets them right. Sometimes he get them, gets them wrong, right? But it's very clear that a decision will be taken. And that's what I think we need to think hardest about here. Right? So I have a quick follow-up to that question. What happens when Linus is no longer in control of the whole Linux project? Who takes his place? Does it then? That's a succession question. Yes. That's a succession question, right? And I'm not to derail this. This is still an open stack uh, <laughs> more panel. So I want to talk about, not talk about Linux. But I, I, is, is, is Linux going to suffer the same fate as OpenStack is if, if there is no... If it becomes a committee, yes, right? Anyway, to, to, to be clear, first I'd say OpenStack is, the core is working well. There's a lot of obfuscation around that that confuses it. The core is working well. I think we all agree, yeah. right? And what we're talking about here is how we can go even better, right? And I would say the key thing to think about is how do we take tough decisions? Like how do we give people a mandate to take tough, de tough decisions? And it's not by voting every six months. So, so then this is leading into the uh, next set of questions on decisions, right? So I would like to ask by um, sort of starting on a question on architecture. So what, in your opinion, needs to change with OpenStack if it has to stay relevant in the future? Steve, you want to go with, uh, from a user perspective? Yeah, I, I think it's the point that I made earlier, is that it's really more attention to um, the realities of deploying OpenStack at scale in enterprises and service providers, but just, let's just call them all enterprises. A service provider is just a particular type of enterprise. Uh, and that isn't necessarily about scale in terms of number of things, although that's a big part of it. It's what's happened once you've deployed thousands of things. How do you manage them? How do you monitor them? How are you going to require all those things to be totally reinstalled? Mm -hmm. Because that's the upgrade process, that's insane, that's impractical. I see this e even in, I mean, some vendors have basically um, codified this and said, if you want to go from community OpenStack to my vendor OpenStack, the process is install it Greenfield. Forget your installed base of 50,000 VMs, just nuke them all and, I mean, and that's craziness. And the, the fact that a vendor could think that that was even a reasonable approach. And so to me, it is a cultural thing that we all have to, I, and I get that like a big part of, I think part of the success of OpenStack has been that it has been so easy for any individual contributor to stand up DevStack or stand up a cluster of four servers or 10 servers. And it works really well at that scale, but they do not have the perspective of running OpenStack on thousands of servers across five data centers, possibly across multiple continents. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm going to say the same thing, but with an economic perspective. Um, I think that we need to have a hard look at the cost of deploying OpenStack at scale. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we've actually done this uh, at Scality. And we're not a huge scale, but we, we have a fairly large. 
um, probably about 100 server uh, deployment. Um, and uh, it's not cheaper than alternatives right now. I mean, wh when you add everything and all the skills that you need to actually deploy it and make it run, it's not cheaper. It, it should be. I mean, I, I expected it to be before doing the analysis. I think that's that's one thing. And that's really, we're talking about the same thing just from a technical perspective. From an so, economic when, so when you did your modeling, did you talk uh, at human? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so actually, can I just address that? Because I think it's, a, sorry, just quick response. OpenStack itself is cheaper. It's free. Operating OpenStack, no, no, but this is a point, right? How you operate it and how much capacity you use and how, right, if you provision it, right, and you bring in your tenants and you can do multi-tenancy, then you can get the efficiencies that make it cheaper to operate. But you're right, if you just deploy OpenStack onto a bunch of servers, because operating that is not necessarily going to be cheaper. But I think, and this goes back to the question of what is OpenStack? OpenStack is, you know, it doesn't cost you anything. And if you have, if you build expertise and you build the team, then it can be very uh, cost effective. Yeah. And we found that it absolutely is cheaper. I, I'm sorry, when I look at the cost of something, I'm not interested in just the cost of a component of it. I look at the I cost understand. of running an infrastructure. I understand TCO, <laughs> and we've done that, and it is cheaper for us if we have the right level of utilization and provisioning and so on. So, so Steve, um, am I hearing you correctly in that it's really the scale and the economies of scale? Yes, that's, exa that's exactly it. And this is why scale is important and maturity to make it cost effective. And I will say the single we, we, biggest... We have the different perspectives here of somebody <laughs> who is paid to operate OpenStack and somebody who pays people to operate OpenStack. Okay. Yeah, uh, and the economics are the issue, and the human economics, to your point, are the issue. Yes. When you said OpenStack is free, you're exactly right. We're in an era where scarcity has shifted from software to operations, right? Think about it. Software used to be incredibly expensive. Now it's free. Operations used to be cheap. Now they're incredibly expensive. And that is something very few institutions have understood. This is why we have this relentless focus on the encapsulation of operations knowledge in charms as code so that we can up-level Instead of just collaborating around the applications, which are not the bottleneck anymore, we collaborate around the operations. I was very serious when I said an organization should be able to point at a bunch of racks and say, give me a cloud and have zero people in the building who know anything about Nova, Swift, Neutron, Cinder. That's not to say that the best organizations won't employ those people because we need to advance the state of the art at the scale of thousands. Those charms should encapsulate the knowledge that's being achieved at the cutting edge. But that operational knowledge needs then to become consumable at your scale, free of charge. And that's the magic that people haven't yet started to really think about. So, yeah, no, yeah. I'll add on to that. I mean, I think what I hear in a large sense here, and what we hear from our customers is not that OpenStack itself is unattractive, but there's a life cycle management problem that they haven't solved. That doesn't necessarily need to be part of OpenStack, and some of it is very custom per the customer going in there, but I mean, the bare metal piece and where they're trying to attack with stuff like Ironic, getting the charms and stuff in place, making sure that everything at large scale can properly be tracked, properly be set up. That's a big issue. But let's, let's just go a bit deeper, right? Here we're all gazing at our navel about OpenStack. OpenStack is just one example. We're in an era now where every interesting application or piece of software or domain is what we call big software, right? It's many pieces of software, and those pieces change every six months. And that's true of Apache Hadoop. It's true of Kubernetes. It's true of Mesosphere DCOS. It's true of machine learning. It's true of all of the container application uh, orchestration systems. It's going to be true of every interesting thing the CIO wants to get done over the next 20 years, right? Big software. But we're still attacking that with a view that you need to hire a bunch of people and create a bunch of automation, right? We have, to, we have to step back and realize that all of these classes of software are really taking us into a domain where operations 
of a challenge, not access to the code. So, so I'd can I like to? Yeah, go ahead. And uh, so I just wanted to actually yeah. get into the, the yeah. this. Th I think this is the most important point, and this is why I think maturity is critical as the focus for the OpenStack community and scale. Um, when I look at what I am paid to run OpenStack, uh, and I love doing it, um, and what I will say is when I say OpenStack is, is free because when I look at what my operations team does, I have a team of about 10 people do operations. Maintaining OpenStack is not what they spend their time on. And so part of me saying OpenStack is free is, is, a, re is a relative comparison because the things they spend their time on, they would have to do in other environments. It's hardware maintenance, it's t tenant onboarding, it's a lot of stuff that is not specific to OpenStack, and that's a test to the quality of the core of OpenStack. The other aspect of this, and this was exactly what you, you hinted at, is it, it is the economies of scale and it's the utilization. We get value by making sure that we run at a high enough utilization on our very expensive servers to justify the cost. It's very easy to get sucked into overpaying for capacity of physical infrastructure that you just don't need, and that is when it absolutely will not be cost effective. So I think what you said, Mark, is absolutely correct. We have to take our learnings and feedback, and this goes, just go back to one of your questions about uh, meritocracy and contributions. Matthew, you made a really good point. Contribution does not just mean code in the purest sense. We have a huge community of people on our team that have done a lot of contributions to documentation in operator best practices, and it's nice to see the community recognizing them as you don't have to be a developer to get contributions. We've had people elected to the user committee recognizing their contributions in other domains than code. So I, I just wanted to give a little bit of insight because I think it addresses many of the questions. It's just understanding actually how a large enterprise uses OpenStack and why I can sit up here and confidently say, to me, OpenStack has been a very successful product when I look at the core as a tool for building infrastructure for a very large number of production applications. Thank you. So I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, who wants to go? Uh, gentlemen, thank you for taking my, call, my question. Uh, my employer pays me to work on OpenStack to, do, uh, to manage it. Lift the mic up. Uh, my employer pays me to manage OpenStack. At home, I use it as a means to an end. It's products that I want. They're things that I want. So as a user, I mean, I use it at work, but you know, I'm interested in more in what I can do with it as a means to an end. What would it take to influence that to be able to say, okay, well, I want, I want my desktop in the cloud somewhere, and I want to be able to access it from anywhere, those kind of things. As just a single contributor, how can I influence that? The direction, the direction of OpenStack in that way. Um, I would say, and this may sound maybe not the answer you want to hear, but maybe OpenStack isn't the right place to contribute in that direction. I think what you describe um, maybe goes back to the point about what's core and what's not. And I think many of those things, you will have a lot more success. Uh, and I say this because I think it's a positive answer. If you want to do something that you don't, see, that you see is is way out of scope the route to success for you is not to try to get it to be in scope. It's not to shift the scope of OpenStack. It's to go off and build your own thing. And hey, maybe you are onto something that no one else has thought of. And you can be very successful because you don't have to answer to committees and elections and all that kind of crap. Um, and I think that that's how I would approach it if I were you. Yeah, for your specific case, running your desktop in the cloud, I'd say apps, OpenStack absolutely should do that. that that is just a machine running in the cloud. Um, uh, I think in, in, in terms of you as a guy that who's paid to understand how OpenStack behaves operationally, what I would like to see is that you are able to contribute co operations code that makes Andrew's life easier, that makes uh, Luke? Jerome. Jerome's life easier because what you're learning is not going into documentation that someone has to then go and read and understand and remember in order to make their OpenStack better, but it's actually going into code which everybody else just runs, right? And so that's, that's why I think OpenStack professionals are important because their learnings should then be shared as code just like Nova is shared as code. There's another 
Oh, yeah. So we have time for one more? Yeah. So uh, we, we talked about technical. We talked about politics. But if you look at it from a business perspective, how does that apply to what you define as what you want to be core, which is just disk storage, you know, networking and virtualization? And from a business perspective, people want database as a service and all the projects that have come in in the last two years. So I think you should divorce the code quality problem from core, just like Linux does it with user space programs. And where do you see, from a business perspective, where do you see the number of projects topping off in this project that would be acceptable to be as part of OpenStack? You, you can't possibly just want database as a service on OpenStack, well, why right? Why containers and everything else that, that but hold on. So I think at a holistic level, it's a yeah. question here. You, you, you want that stuff on public and private cloud. And realistically, the important public clouds don't talk OpenStack, right? You want that on AWS, you want that Azure, and you want that on Google. So I'm saying, what you want is exactly right. Everybody thinking that this is the forum to make it mm -hmm. is exactly wrong, right? As OpenStack as a community, we should benchmark our success, not by the fact that we have a project that promises database as a service, but that we have a commitment from the best database as a service vendors in the world, who are currently on the public clouds, that their stuff will run on OpenStack. Right. RefStack is more important than Trove, right? Because RefStack allows a winning database as a service vendor that gives a CIO real options on lots of public clouds also to make the commitment to do that on OpenStack, right? And so we should benchmark OpenStack by the number of global winning projects as a service on the public cloud that also put OpenStack on their, on their sort of badges of success, right? Harmonious. On this certification list. Right. So your, your, your requirements are exactly right, but, but this project is not the right place to fulfill mm -hmm. them. If we do our job right, then the experts out there in cloud will come to OpenStack. So with that, I think we're out of time. So, um, so I'd like to have uh, you guys give us closing questions, uh, so closing comments, I'm sorry. So Matt, you wanna go? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think we're really talking from a perspective here and overall thing. We're seeing this as more of an architecture as opposed to an implementation sort of story. And um, from a business perspective, I mean, I think there are a number of features that even in the core, in terms of HA multi-site and stuff, could be brought in. But I really see going forward that we are on the right path if we can fix some of these community problems and bring this together. Uh, there would be a better sort of leadership story. Um, I, I love the, the Miranti slide yesterday. We are just at the very, very tiny beginning of a big journey. And I think it's very important that OpenStack realizes that there will be competition, there will be other cloud systems and uh, it's very important to include the perspective of the whole world and not just to be focused on the island. Yeah, I want to finish by supporting the very first comment that was made from the panel by Steve, that the core of OpenStack is great. And for any medium-sized institution today, it is sufficient, it works, we are at the end of the beginning. <laughs> right? And nothing that anybody said here is questioning the relevance or the purpose or the mission of the core. And Steve is exactly right to open with the statement that OpenStack works, right? Everything we've said here is really about how to get better and questioning some of the blah blah as a service around it. Yeah, I think that's right. It's easy to lose sight of the you know, the core, the point, the the central tenet, which is yes, it works, it's good and we should all be proud of that. Uh, I think the other thing I'd say is, Mark is absolutely right, that your goal as customers, as service providers to your enterprises should be running applications that are best in class applications and those don't have to be part of OpenStack to, to add value to your customers. Um, and I think the other thing that we didn't really talk much about is what is the customer focus. I think that's an important part of being an enterprise cloud provider is we have to all start thinking customer first, right? What do our customers actually need of what we're delivering? But that doesn't mean it has to be filtered in back to OpenStack 
blindly and said, we need to make this part of OpenStack. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you.